Hi, Katie. It's so lovely to have you join us today at AuthorLink to discuss oh. your wonderful new novel, The Boys. Oh. It's a pleasure. Thank you, Anna, for having me. Yeah, well, we've got a, a few questions up ahead, but um, we won't take too much of your time and uh, hope you enjoy the questions as well. So why don't you start off by telling us a little bit about The Boys? So um, the, the, the book is about, um, it's about a man named Ethan Fawcett who um, he has some social awkwardness in um, the way he interacts with people. He's had some trauma in his childhood. He falls in love with a woman named Barb who um, kind of brings him out of his shell. She's a very compassionate woman. Uh, she studies loneliness among older adults and um, she's st studying psychology and uh, they get married and then uh, things fall apart for <laughs> reasons that are a little bit unclear to the reader until you get to the second half of the book which, as my editor likes to say, stuff happens. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. And I understand that your editor is uh, Cindy Grau? Spiegel. Spiegel. Uh, no, oh, Spiegel. Oh, it's Julie Grau. It's Spiegel and Grau. So it's yeah, Julie Spiegel. Grau and Cindy Spiegel. Yeah, yeah, and they, so they used to be an imprint of Random House when it was just Random House. And then they went off on their own a couple of years ago. And The Boys is their first novel um, as an independent publisher. Yeah, that's impressive. I mean, I've always known about Spiegel and Grau, and I just had them had their, the publishing name in my head for a while now. But then when I realised that it was, you know, two women and, uh, and actually they were both big fans of yours from beforehand. Um, and I love how I read somewhere that Cindy, Cindy said something that, uh, you know, that you took a real risk and that she was really, really behind you in that. And uh, I think that's really great that you have that kind of relationship with your editors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm not a novelist by, you know, historically. Uh, I'm a journalist. So making that leap can be uh, risky and also kind of fraught with peril. And uh, so I wrote the entire book before submitting it to Cindy because she needed to see that I could do it. Uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and also my agent who didn't say, you know, Katie, stay in your lane, which he could have. Yeah. And instead he said, sure, sure, sure let's try it. <laughs> so, yeah, very, very uh brave of him as well because as an agent you know agents i think we tend to forget that agents have a reputation too and so they uh, their track record is just as important as the author's track record yes. and so they don't want to go off sort of you know out, way out on a limb saying oh i have this journalist i've been representing for years and now she's decided to do a novel. I mean, that could be, that's risky for them as well. That's true. I mean, I, I think over the years, though, they have become a lot more flexible when it comes to different genres. And mm -hmm. uh, we're kind of moving away from uh, that stickler of marketing that, that the uh, publishers want us to stick to or writers mm -hmm. want to stick to. I think well, that's and, Oh, sorry. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> Well, I think, and that's in that vein, I think that it's very interesting about Spiegel and Grau in that they are doing all this sort of class platform uh, work, you know, podcasts to book, books to podcast, podcasts to film, books to film, uh, a lot of crossover. And they're thinking about publishing very differently um, because they can, because they're lean and because julie and cindy run it and they don't answer to anyone but themselves yeah it's wonderful i mean it's it, even the boys is something that you can't classify you can't put it into a particular it's got a, a you right. know 
a number of uh, different aspects and themes running through it. Right. I mean, if you if you were going to categorize it, what would you what would you say? Uh, a fabulous book. <laughs> cool. I, I there should don't, be a I, whole shelf in bookstores. <laughs> just plain, straight up, yeah, fabulous just books. Fab. Uh, no, I, um, look, it's it has the look. It's definitely nostalgic. It talks about loss. It talks about relationships, um, isolation, COVID. Um, what uh, what our past does to our present. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's but but then there's also a, a wonderful twist to it which I will not disclose. Um, so Thank it, you for not disclosing <laughs> it. So of, of course, uh, you know, this is something that is 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 like wow. But you know, the empathy rushes out, and um, you know, by the end of the book, you're just like <laughs> getting the tissues out. So. It's really hard to to slot into some like one particular genre or category or it's it's got a little bit of everything and it's very enjoyable. It's beautifully written. You're an amazing storyteller. Um, oh, thank you. So I imagine that that you know being a New York Times journalist for over ten years and a New York Times journal journalist uh, and 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 also contributing to a number of very you know high-end, you know, credible with integrity magazines and newspapers and, uh, you know, you would probably be very good at writing. (laughs) So now that you've come to fiction, has that been Mm. hard for you from non-fiction, from journalism work? Yeah. Because you've actually written about six, seven books as well. Yes, <laughs> and non, a memoir. You've, you've yeah. done a little bit of everything. You've done journalism. You've got memoir under there, which was beautiful. Me, mm-hmm. mother, um, and mother, my, daughter, me. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, uh, I, I, I mix it up with your podcast. Um, oh, our mothers ourselves. Yeah, it's all yeah. very confusing. Like, a lot of <laughs> mother, 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 mother stuff. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, and then you've you know you've written some very interesting books. Uh, on uh, on hackers, on the computer age, on the post world war uh, Germany. To Germany. Um, mm-hmm. So you know, it's it seems like you whatever you're really interested in and what you've been motivated to 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 research, you've wanted to write about, and and now you've you've come into a novel. How 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 hard has that been for you to? The transition, you mean? Yes. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, it can be very, very hard and perilous, I think, to move from nonfiction to fiction because as a reporter for years and years and years, I've been sort of tyrannized by the facts, like everything, especially the New York Times, you know, everything must absolutely be correct. Um, Now I run this podcast where we care so much about getting things right. It's a... um, and we we do a ton of dil- diligent fact checking, um, and because it matters, and and so that can be very constraining. It can be a bit of a straitjacket, and so then if you think about going into fiction, it's it's both liberating and paralyzing at the same time. It's liberating because suddenly the world is your oyster. You know anything goes, yeah. and it's paralyzing for precisely the same reason, because anything goes. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think with a lot of journalists, they kind of go off a deep end. And even though you might say about the boys, well, wait a minute, that's a deep end, because we won't talk about what happens, but it's um, it's hard to get your mind around. Um, But what I wanted to do was root it in something very real, which is a marriage and the trauma that Ethan experienced as a little boy, all of this, it's, and it's all very real, on top of which I layer a lot of my own reporting through the years that I've been reporting onto the story. Just for instance, I mentioned that Barb, uh, Ethan's wife, um, got her PhD in psychology looking closely at the phenomenon, which is a true public health hazard, um, 
of loneliness and social isolation among older adults. And I spent six months doing a New York Times story on that precise subject. I went to Blackpool, England. I sat in on this loneliness hotline in Blackpool where all these calls were coming in from these isolated adults. There actually was, I mean, isolated older adults. Um, there actually was a woman in her 80s. It was her birthday. And she hadn't used her, she had not spoken for a week even though her kids lived within a couple of miles. And, um, and I was heartbroken. And uh, the woman taking the call was just so wonderful. And I thought, you know, so when I thought, what could Barb do for a living that shows her compassion? It was that. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of other, just all the reporting and sort of the wisdom from the reporting, not so much from living, but from having reported for so long, almost about the human condition, mm. um, I put in the book, and I think that it really rooted it in a lot of plausibility, uh, if that answers your question. <clears throat> yeah, well, definitely, because it's um, you, you, f you feel like you're reading about people that by the end of the novel you've considered your neighbors or your good friends you, you they kind of live on very um realistically in your mind's eye so it's uh really beautifully yeah and when you i think it's do you consider that kind of the mark of a novel you're going to stick with when you're reading it like you care about the people is that what yes definitely because you know yeah. that's how it is with novels like they just sort of keep on humming after yeah. you put the book down and then, of course, the next thing is, well, what else is this author going to write? So then you rush back to find some new people to get to know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm trying to, so Cindy and I are now talking about a new novel. And I want to bring that same sense of, because the, the Boys is very quirky. It has some very quirky scenes and ideas in it. And so I want to bring that but also this sense of kind of characters you just like. Yeah. Um, and when I wrote it, uh, so the manuscript was not accepted immediately. It got, as manuscripts do, it got um, rejected by a number of publishers. And one of the rejections was from this uh, editor at Holt named Connor I can't remember his last, last name, really nice. And he wrote to my agent and he said, you know, I absolutely love the book. I was t taken with it from the beginning. When the twist came, I was literally like shocked. My jaw was on the ground. Um, and my wife tells me that if we don't publish this book, we'll, I'll, you know, I'll never forgive myself. But he couldn't get the rest of his editorial team to go with it. Um, so... Uh, I wrote him, a th I, my agent sent me that. And so I wrote Connor a thank you note. I thanked my, yeah. the person who rejected my book. And, um, <laughs> and I said, thank you so much. It was, I'm so glad you really got it. And thank you so much, for whatever I said. Um, and then he wrote back this really, really sweet note. And I said back, I said back to him, you know, I set out to write a book that was populated by characters who are at their core fundamentally good people. And he wrote back the most interesting thing. He said, you know, there's an industry adage in publishing that happiness writes white, i.e. invisible. Um, but you managed to pull it off with characters who are good, who are, who are, who are um, likable, and it doesn't flag at all. And, um, and it made me feel really good because I, we were going the time, just the times we've been going through to write something edgy and dark and depressing didn't seem like what, it just seemed like people could use a breath of fresh air. I agree. Um, and also I wrote this memoir about, I mean, my childhood was really filled with dodgy, dark characters 
Right. Um, and I thought, why would I, having lived through that, why would I want to live for another three years with people I make up who are <laughs> depressing, <laughs> horrible people? You can't I mean, easily I, get rid of. <laughs> that you can't get rid of because you had yeah. right. And so, and I just thought the world needed a little bit, something a little bit different. So, um, yeah. and people, when I, I do a lot of talking to book groups and they, they love that about the book. They say, thank you for not bringing us down. Yeah, no, I agree. And I, 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 um, I, I'm a really huge fan of, of what are those novels called? Not chit lit, but, um, where they're happy lit basically, but they're not so innocuous as to be boring. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got some characters, they're real, they have some flaws, um, mm -hmm. and you're rooting for them and, uh, it's an enjoyable read, but it's not, I mean, you know, there's right. some sad things, it's, it's just life. But it's not like, you know, awful crime and you right. know, pedophilia yeah. and things that are really desperately unhappy right. subjects. So, yes, like the, thank you. Oh, what is the one? I love that happy book about even though he's conf he's a quadriplegic and she's, what is that one, Jojo Moyes? Um, ah, yes. Uh, yeah, what is um, it you, be, you Before Me. You Before Me. I love that yes. because... I yeah. don't know what it is about that book, but I absolutely yeah. love it. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about? Yes, and also um, let me just think of some good ones that, that just sort of... Uh, oh, uh, well, my my very favourite of all time, which is I Capture the Castle, Yeah, um, Jody yeah. Smith, which is yeah. J.K. Rowling's favourite book, which oh, is well, really... There you go. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Because yeah. Harry Potter is dark. Yeah. And, but she yeah. loves I Capture the Castle, yeah. so... Yeah, I think I think there there's a place for um, more levity in our lives, and I don't think it's mm -hmm. too white. You know, I think that we uh, have been conditioned to think that we need to that we can only turn the page if there's like some kind of nail biting scenario. But in fact, it could just be the human condition and what's going to happen next, which is beautifully um, illustrated in the boys. So, uh, what I wanted to ask you now, though, is You've also got a number of other things that you do. I just recently saw you also uh, authored a course on Domestica, which is, like, amazing. You've got mm. three podcasts. That's what I want to talk about next. One of them is about um, the children of remarkable mothers. I just thought, mm -hmm. what a fantastic idea. Um, how did that come about, and who have been the most remarkable oh. mothers on that? Yeah, um, I can t I'd can. i love to tell you. So, um uh, uh, the pandemic had just started, and again, I we were all so depressed and I completely isolated. And I thought, I just maybe I'll just do. A, I was doing these really depressing stories that were making me weep while I was reporting them for the New York Times about COVID, about people who were dying alone because they couldn't have visitors, and people who were delaying going to the the emergency room because they were scared and so they ended up dying in horrible stories just really upsetting and um and i was walking down the street which was all you could do in the back then and i thought wait a minute i bet there must be something really positive i could do and uh so i thought I should do a podcast, even though I had never touched anything to do with anything audio related. Wow. And I thought, oh, I'm going to do a podcast where I interview, I like to interview people. I'm going to do an, a podcast where I interview the, the offspring of incredible women who were also incredible mothers and no alcoholics, no deadbeats, no neglectful, <laughs> no right. abusive, nothing. They cannot, they cannot cross my threshold. <laughs> and so I, I got this idea to do this one on my 10th grade geometry teacher, Mrs. Fitzpatrick. I don't know why she popped into my head. She, I barely knew her. I just loved her. And I thought, I bet she was a great mom. And sure enough, I found her daughter. And I think, Anna, I had no idea what I was doing. I was like recording practically by holding the microphone up to the phone. <laughs> and I was doing it on GarageBand, which I knew was in my in my Mac, but I didn't know how to use it. So I mm -hmm. sort 
did that and then I stole some music and I held the bat up to the oh, up no. to the garage band and then, <laughs> and then it took me oh my gosh it took me days and days and days to, to put this thing together and I was like cutting and splicing and it had all these breaks in it and I had to keep asking the daughter to like send me a new recording of something because it had gotten lost and and then I sent it to my husband who was sitting downstairs of course working and I and I felt like a so a little child saying look what I made <laughs> and, and oh my dog is uh can you hear him uh okay so I um so I uh and he loved it and um I just started uh interviewing all these people who so I interviewed um Oh, Julie Andrews' daughter, and wow. she was such a good mother. And talk about a life of adversity. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you know much about her childhood? It was it's yeah. unbelievable what a tough yeah. childhood she had. Oh, and uh, every time I listen to that one, I start to cry. Oh. Um, I did one on Ruth Bader Ginsburg's mother. Wow, um, and. Uh, Aaron Brockovich's mother, wow. <laughs> and I know, and and then, but then just regular people, yeah. just like someone who had ten kids and made each one of them think they were her favorite. I mean that kind of yeah. thing. So it so yeah. it also so it also it just celebrates extraordinary mothers. Is yeah. what it does. Um, and then yeah. the other one, yeah. the lost women of so then I, I basically I'm my own engineer and my own everything with our with our mothers ourselves, and it's been on a bit of a hiatus, but it's coming back, um, because uh, I started another podcast, which has actually turned into a very big thing, which is called Lost Women of Science. Oh, it's wonderful! I, yeah. Oh, you've you've listened to it. Well, I, I, to be honest, I, I read about it for the first time recently. I haven't had a chance to listen to it, but I will. It's something that really interests me. So I just oh, like the idea yeah. of it. And I understand that you're thinking of creating a new one for children as well. Yeah, we're, we're, um, we're creating what we hope will be a children's book series, a book on series. Lost, Lost, uh, that's based on, on the podcast. Um, and we're in, and we're creating, um, shorts these things so we have these multi-episode seasons that celebrate one woman who was completely lost and just on friday we you know you've made it when you become a jeopardy clue <laughs> on, <laughs> on friday wow. yes our season That's one amazing. subject was the question <laughs> yes and she was completely unknown before <laughs> we got to her so we're very very happy about that That's amazing. Uh, yeah, it is. Well, it's very, uh, very gratifying. Yeah, that's that's so. Yeah. Well, there you go. See. Yeah. That's given voice, or you get given a, a number of women that uh, have achieved so much and uh, have been, you know, moved to the side while the the blokes come in and uh, do their thing. Yep. The blokes. <laughs> the Too blokes. many blokes. <laughs> <laughs> Too much so, testosterone out there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, enough already. Um, <laughs> so, so, did you have any like setbacks along the road to your career as a novelist or a, as a nonfiction writer? Did you have any like times where you felt like you can't possibly do this, or as well as being a journalist? Um. Was well, it like an easy, easy thing to do? Were you, or, for instance, like your agent, how long have you known your agent? Was he what, the one that was encouraging you to consider writing nonfiction work as well as do your normal day job? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, it sounds he, lovely. Jim yeah, Levine? Yeah. Jim Levine, yeah. He's Levine. wonderful. Yeah. So supportive. I mean, he's everything you would ever want in an agent. He's supportive. He actually reads what you write. He has a, all publishers in New York love him. Um, he has a great reputation, and uh, and he really, really stands behind his behind his uh, his authors. And he's always suggesting kind of funny things. And he's just he's great. Uh, 
he's Jillian Flynn's agent, you know, Gone Girl. Um, and that's very, very different from what I did. Um, but he has a wide, wide array of, yeah. um, of authors. So what did it feel like when you were, you were sort of starting off, going back now when you were starting out at the New York Times, what did it feel like getting that phone call that you were uh, accepted and yes. so you were uh, yeah, asked to, to work at the New York Times? What did that well, feel like? I was working at Newsweek at the time, back when Newsweek was a big thing. This was in 1998, and I got, I just, and I'd been writing about tech for a very, very long time already in 1998. Wow. And I know. And I, they were starting a new section called the circuits section, which is about basically technology. Um, and I got a call from an editor named Tim Race, and he'd been following my work for a long time. And he just said, I mean, he, they basically recruited me. So I didn't wow. apply. Yeah. They didn't ap- you were poached. So I was approached, which is very, um, and same with Newsweek, I was approached. That's um, and, and only because I was one of very few women covering technology probably one of the very first to cover technology, at least in the United States, um, uh, that because that started in the early 1980s. So, um, so, uh, so that, and I, t- and then uh, my editor, who wasn't Tim, but a, um, a man named Jim Gorman, we had, oh my gosh, Anna. So it was this section called Circuits where we looked at all the things that we take for granted now, like love over email kind of didn't exist back then. People, you know, um, feeling tethered to their devices. None of that yet. Uh, I wrote the first story about GPS, like a GPS system, the first story about Bluetooth. like And then in 1998, right after I'd gotten to the times, a friend called and he said, I'm investing in this company and they're going to start a search engine to which I said, why do we need another search engine? <laughs> and it was Google. Oh, so, my God. I know. Right. Yeah. So, uh, so, um, uh, so that was a very, very exciting time to be covering yeah, technology. Definitely. All right, I've got a few more minutes left, but I just wanted to quickly ask you about your 28 inches shelf. Oh, right. It's right behind me. Should oh, I? is it? I it's love your right selection there. of books. And I just wanted it's to right ask. there, and I haven't, yeah, there it oh, is. There you go. I see it. Yeah. Oh, there's so more than one. Get... There was just one. Okay. Oh, no, it's just that middle shelf is my. Oh, the middle shelf. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what I wanted to ask you. going over the edge. Oh, yeah. by the way, she, is the dog bothering you? Because I could also let him out of his crate. You can't even hear him? I can hear a little bit, but it's not bothering me at all. I have, oh, okay. I have animals as well, so I know. Oh, that. okay. Um, what I was going to say is, um, so are you, you going to start writing a little bit about each one of those books and why you've yes. chosen them to be your special, special I've book? I've only written about one, and I forget which one I wrote about. Yeah, I have to get going on that. So... Uh, if somebody was to look at that shelf up close, what, in okay. your opinion, do you think would be the book that they would be most surprised about of your choice? Uh, golf in the Kingdom. Yeah. <laughs> Don't you think? As in golf? You know, as in golf, yeah. <laughs> do you see That's it amazing. Can you see I, it? Yeah. I, so that would be something that many people wouldn't have expected to see that there or? Uh, no, I mean, oh. who expects to see a book about golf? Um, <laughs> you don't play? Or, no. I do, well, I do now because uh-huh. um, my husband, who's a two-trick pony, uh, he has his job as a yeah. physician and golf. And so I thought, well, if I want to spend more time with this guy as we enter <laughs> our dotage, yeah. then I better Learn. do something. So, um, and then this book, Golf in the Kingdom, which is one of the most beautifully written kind of tributes to the game. It's sold actually a mil, it's sold more than a million copies. It's a huge, wow. because it's all about the spiritual 
aspects of the game. It takes place in kind of this mythical course that's really St. Andrews, maybe, um, in Scotland. Nice. Um, and the, the main character is someone named Chivas Irons. <laughs> uh, it's really just beautiful. Right. So I love okay. that one. Well, I might give it a look-see then. No, maybe not. Um, not if you don't. If you're not, are you a golfer? No, but no, I do no. like okay, grass. Then I'm walking. No, no. No, no, do not read that. But then there's <laughs> I Cap. I think I Capture the Castle is up there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's just a great book too. Yeah. Okay, just quickly uh, before our time runs out, um, Mother Daughter Me, you, um, firstly, did your mother ever read the book in the end? She said in the beginning she wouldn't. Well, um, she, I believe she read bits of it enough to, stop speaking to me and also want to uh, bring a lawsuit against me. Oh. And it was very, very painful that a book that I wrote honestly, uh, she took great offense. At. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's it's a very, you know, but it, it brings us to kind of a last, a, a, a kind of painful, question which is you know when you write um who i who might you hurt and um and uh i think i underestimated or overestimated rather her resilience or her ability to sort of see, sit back i don't know if you've read the book um oh, yeah. but yeah well you'll see it people are surprised because they say it's a love it's a love letter to your mother but she didn't see it that way. So yeah, that's very sad. I haven't spoken really to her really beyond just some little things like she's needed some um, help with doctors and I've arranged that for her because of my husband's position, but I am basically dead to her, which is very, very, very sad. Oh, that is sad. Isn't it? I know. That is yeah. sad because yeah, no, I am. Um... I I wonder it's on my reading list, but it's just that it's something that I, I didn't go to straight away because I have something similar and it's sort oh, of Oh you do? Yeah. What's your just, mom? Well, nothing compared to but you know, like we all walk around with our past sitting on our shoulders and 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 I've I'm reading a lot in, in my daily life and I just thought, oh, okay, I'll read this one but soon, yeah. Mm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um but I, I remember reading that when you did get through that year when you were together and trying to help each other not so successfully um that you ended up it was a like a like a positive thing in the end that you basically you love your people what's and all and that's just life and that's how love is um, yeah. but you said that it really helped you rather than go to a psychologist or just to write it all down. And in, for somebody that you said writes, has difficulty writing 500 words, you actually managed to write thousands and thousands of words in the space of a few hours. How is, mm -hmm. how is it, firstly, how is it possible that you, with such an amazing career, could just find it difficult to write 500 words? And, um, and did you feel better, second question, did you feel better when you wrote, the thousands and thousands of words did did did, did it all come out mm -hmm. yeah um, i did the answer i'll answer the second part first which is yes i was surprised by how quickly i could write that story um but the 500 words in general i just um i'm a very slow writer partly because i'm so hard on myself and so what i i do a lot of teaching of writing and I tell people, I say, don't do what I do, which is just agonize. Just if it's, if you need a better word than the cliche that you've come up with, because a lot of it is about my language and my use of language and how um, difficult that is for me to come up with just the right language. Um, just put a in brackets, just put, find something better, FSB in brackets and move on. And that'll make things go more quickly. Wow. <laughs> okay, thank you. Well, it looks like our time's running out, but I just wanted to say um, it's been an absolute pleasure having a chat to you tonight. 
and well, thank uh, you all so much. Same. Same. Yeah. yeah. And um, I just um I just wanted to ask you what's on the horizon for you? Oh, same old. <laughs> <laughs> Lost Women of Science and a new novel. Oh, lovely. No any idea about the new novel yet or still yes. just Yes, I'm don't coming want to up talk. I'm coming up with a plot. And yeah. it's going to be, again, quirky and people you will like. 